You're welcome, Internet. This is your host, Viet, and we're back with another edition of Face the Facts, a series where we interview professional athletes and ask them the tough questions donks like Luke Thomas are too busy ruining the MMA hour to ask. Here at Face the Facts, we appreciate great cinema. Like 300. The 2006 American Fantasy War film based on the 1998 comic series of the same name by Frank Miller and Lynn Varley. Now 2006 was a simpler time, when we were impressed when actors just got in shape for their job. They go through the trouble of having an absolutely historically accurate account of the Battle of Thermopylae within the Persian Wars, complete with dudes that now have bow flexes. Spoiler alert. In the end, a bunch of Spartans die. Sorry Leonidas. Should have let Quasimodo join the squad. At least let him play lookout or something, you know? Like in that one area where the enemy could march through and straight up bamboozle your shit. And now Gerald Butler is going hunchback and Notre Dame it, wondering if the next movie in the Fallen franchise is about just another city or his career. This is Face to Facts, and we promote true investigative podcasting. We ask the hard-hitting questions. We know our tenaciousness might scare off some people, which is why we respect anyone that comes on our show to face us. This week, we are joined by 10th ranked bantamweight Cody Stamen. We talk about his fight with Aljo at UFC 228, the art of booking a fight, and when trash talking gets really weird. All right. We are uh, joined by number 10th ranked UFC bantamweight Cody Stamen. All right, Cody. Uh, let's see. Let's start off with your nickname or nicknames. You got both Mr. Wonderful and Spartan. Now, I, I gather that the, the, the Spartan nickname, that's from your hometown, correct? Right, right. Spartan, Michigan. Spartan. Right. Uh, How did you get Mr. Wonderful? Oh, uh, good story. Um, one of my first MMA coaches uh, noticed that I was always uh, chasing girls around. And uh, he... Uh, he started calling me Mr. Wonderful, and it was a joke, and a bunch of guys at the gym could started saying it, and they knew it really bugged me. He somehow <laughs> ended up on a fight card, and I just never, I, I never, uh, I could never outrun it. And eventually, uh, someone suggested the Spartan just so I could represent my hometown, and I was, uh, I was more than uh, thrilled to change it. <laughs> I think, but I think I, I've still seen the Mr. Wonderful nickname in some of the, the UFC promotional stuff. I know it still shows up. I don't know. I'm telling you, it just, you can't kill that nickname. There's, I've tried. There's no I've paperwork to fill out to management to get to get them. The, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So I know, like, there's only so many uh, nicknames and stuff. Some people have like really unique ones, and they kind of make it their own. But you know, so like, Phil Davis is he also goes by Mr. Wonderful. If you have right. like two fighters right. that have like the same nickname, like, what, what do you guys have to do? Do you have to paper rock scissors? Do you guys have to fight it out or? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I think, I think he probably had his, his, uh, his nickname before me, so he can, he can have it. I'm good with being the Spartans. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you didn't, you don't exactly care for it too much. Um, no. I wonder if, like, you ever, are you going to really, like, lean into the, the Spartan thing? Like, are you going to walk out to, like, the 300 soundtrack, uh, show up with, like, the helmet and everything? Uh, I mean, if, if you could, I think I, I probably would, but, uh, probably minus the helmet i think i think it's more like i uh i like the i like the concept i like the spartan mentality um i like the way the uh the spartans lived and what they believed in i uh i think it's i mean it's uh it's an ideal mentality for what we do what i do for a living and uh it's just a, it's just cool I, I, i'm really kind of a nerd for greek mythology um just just to just to know like that it was like no, nothing was really written down. This was all, you know, fables and everything was just told, you know, through, uh, through people mostly. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's kind of cool to, to hear how, how the, the stories kind of vary in, in different, uh, right. different ways. Right. It was a, a city state of, of Sparta. Like, they, they were pretty hardcore. Like if you, if you read some of the stuff they did, they would actually put their facilities like, far apart from each other so like the women would actually have to travel further <laughs> you know that they carry things and stuff like that they just made daily life a little bit tougher i guess yeah as a as a way to make themselves uh, and, it's, tougher. It's, and it's funny because like we do the exact opposite now right oh yeah 
<laughs> Everything's right. closed, convenient. We don't even go to stores anymore. We have Amazon deliver everything to us. So. I know, I know. I literally, I, I, uh, I'm a huge like. I have to like cut myself off sometimes because I like start thinking about something I really want, and then I'm just like, oh my god, you know what? I just, I buy that right now. Next, it's gonna be on my doorstep tomorrow. Right. And just knowing that it's just so it's consumers. Mm. Right. They have same-day delivery now, which blows my mind. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. absolutely insane. I and know. I think I think the crazy thing to me is that, like, you can't – like, the price point is competitive. Like, I could get toothpaste yeah. on – for, like, um, same-day delivery for cheaper than going to the store. So why would I ever go to, like, a Target or something to buy toothpaste right. ever again? No, I know. It's absolutely insane. It's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know a lot of people that literally just shop on Amazon. They do everything on Amazon. It's crazy. Yeah. I think they're going to take over that aspect of our life pretty soon. It won't even be called shopping. It's like, oh yeah, I'm on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> they got everything. Don't even leave their house. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think that's the the downfall of Western civilization? We'll just get all super super lazy. <laughs> uh honestly, yeah, yeah, I really, really do. I really do. And it's it's funny because uh, you know recently I had I had someone tell me uh, I was talking about cutting weight and kind of the discipline and what it takes to be a martial artist and this guy just looked at me and he's like, why though? f would you want to do that <laughs> and like and really it was it was super i mean he made like a really nice dinner party like super awkward and i just looked at him and i was like i don't know man i just uh i, I like i was really trying to bite my tongue because there were a lot of like really nice people there mm -hmm. i was like i don't know i just uh i just think there's more to life than just you know waking up and and uh you know living this mundane day-to-day -day thing and uh i don't know i think i think uh the, the simplicity of it and the, I don't know, the, just the, the constant challenge, you know, like you're never, you're never good enough as a martial artist. And I think if you don't have that in, in life, not even martial arts, but if you don't have something that like challenges you, then I don't know, what's, what's the point, you know, like, are you really living? I mean, you're kind of just existing. You know, I think that's an aspect of the sport that like really speaks to a lot of fans. And, you know, we 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 love to romanticize uh, fighters and, and even other sports. It's always the analogy of like this is a fight, like like in football when they're like trying to right. like, pep talk. It's like we're about to go into a fight. This is a war. And there's like that. Right. Uh, you know, we use those terms, but like that's literally what you do. <laughs> you actually oh, are I know. going I know. for a fight. And it's so funny because everything you do in a fight, you can relate to your life, right? So, I mean, it, when the chips are down, you know, everyone's always like, you know, every single motivational speech is like, no, how many times you get you get knocked down, but how many times you get up, you know, mm -hmm. a successful man gets up one more time and you got knocked down. It's like, well, in a fight, in an actual fight, like literally, like, li like that can be the difference between winning and losing. It's like what you do when you get hit, like what, you know, what's your, what's your response? Is it fight or flight? And, right. uh, I, I think, I think, I mean, if you want to reach a certain level as a martial artist, I think that you have to like kind of grow as a person too. You know, I think, honestly, I don't think I'd be, uh, I want to say I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as open and understanding as a, uh, just a person if I wasn't involved in martial arts, uh, just because I came from a small minded, uh, you know, community and, you know, martial arts has just opened my eyes to so many things. And I think it does that for so many people, uh, you know, it brings people together, and it 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 honestly, you have to you have to be a better person if you're going to be a part of this uh, this journey. I think it's a very it's a very cool uh, perspective to have. Now you're still relatively young, but man, you have like a lot of fights under your belt. Uh, Nineteen and one as an amateur. Now you're uh, you have a seventeen and one professional record. Now I've heard you've you've kind of said before, at least when you were starting out fighting was sort of a bucket list thing for you. Like just, Hey, can I do this? Let me try it out. When did yeah. it switch to something? Like, when did that switch? Like walk us through that. You go, you know what? I think I could do this professionally. I think I could do this full time. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I just, I think that I just, I fell in love with the, with the training and uh, the, the camaraderie with the guys at the gym. <clears throat> and I like, I just wanted to be there. I wanted to, I wanted to, train all the time i was skipping other things in my life so that i could train and uh you know what i mean and like work and school and everything kind of took a back seat to me wanting to to compete and, and get ready for him man never really had anything like that in my life i mean i wrestled and i boxed and i played football and I did all these sports but like when the season was over i was like i was i was okay with it you know what i mean like mm -hmm. when it was over it was over i didn't really miss it but with MMA, like there was always, I mean, I felt like there was always more that I could do, more that, more that I could learn. And honestly, I just, I, I fell in love with it. I think it kind of happened slowly, but 
you know, when I when I turned pro, I was I was 22, and that's when it really kind of took my life over. Um, as soon as I turned pro, I think I think everything in my, everything in my life like uh, completely changed. I, uh, you know, I moved away. I I just decided like right then, like I was like I'm not gonna have ass this if I'm really gonna be an athlete. Uh, I want to be the best a- athlete that I absolutely can be, and uh, you know, I made every sacrifice to to be where I am today. Yeah. You, so you you mentioned you uh you actually like you enjoy the training aspect of it. You we've yeah. had some fighters that are pretty open, like uh like George St. Pierre, he said that he loves the fighting part, but he like the training part, that's like kinda tough. <laughs> it's it's a bit of a grind. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know, I I like to see the changes in my body, I guess, more than anything. I, I just uh it's amazing like what, what I can do now, um, like as a workout, like it was like as a warm up now was a workout, you know what I mean, three mm-hmm. months ago. So it's just amazing to see like what your body really can do um, for me. Um, and honestly, I, I, I don't really mind. I don't mind working out. I like uh, I like doing it. I like being at the gym. I like the guys that are, I, I train with, you know, it's a, it's a good environment. Um, there are some workouts that I really wish I could skip. You know what I mean? I wish it was just like, I wish I didn't have to do the drilling and I wish I didn't have to do the hard strength conditioning workouts. I wish I could just, uh, you know, eat whatever the hell I wanted and just spar and, you know, go live all the time. Cause that's really the fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, you know, you want to be good. You gotta, you gotta, you know, get those reps in and that, that can get pretty annoying, you know, like throwing a jab cross a million times. Uh, it gets, it gets pretty boring, but you know, I just, uh, I just look at it like it's just, it's part of my job. You know, I, there's a, sure. there's things I like, and there's obviously in any job, there's going to be things you don't like. So, right. Uh, I mean, you've always been a professional, you know, showed up um, on weight, on point, every single fight you've been to. Is weight cutting, has that ever been an, an issue? Is it, is it, you know, do you find that, that aspect of the, the sport difficult or is that kind of like you're used oh, to? I, I absolutely fucking hate it. I hate it. I hate cutting weight. Uh, the diet, it's awful. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's a tough process. I've, I've hated it since day one. You know what I mean? I'm like a fat kid at heart. You know, I want to eat whatever I want. And, uh, uh, the working out, I swear to God, I think I work, I do an extra workout every day just cause, uh, just so I can eat a little bit more. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like one of those guys, but I've really dialed it in. I know I, I'm, I'm really super organized. I know I, I write everything down. No, I have food logs. I know what my weight was last camp. I know, you know, what changes I need to make. I'm super organized, surprisingly, because every other aspect of my life, I'm like complete chaos. But with uh, with fighting and with my weight and with uh, the training, I'm, I'm actually super organized. But uh, yeah, it's it's it sucks. It's a hard process. I know it's a hard process every single time I do it. But I have like uh, a recipe for success to make weight i'm a huge bantam weight i mean i can get up to 175 pounds wow. uh so and that's not like i mean i'm not like uh i don't like a walking blimp at 175 like i'm just pretty stocky i'm you know right now i think i'm like six percent body fat and uh i'm in the low 50s okay. you know like 55 50 55 that's what i'm walking around at right now and uh you know that's that m- most guys at at bantamweight, uh, you know, week of are are forty five. At least that's what I've seen thus far. Yeah, like so you're not. I yeah, we're I'm, not far out at this point. So that's yeah. I'm 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 easily one of the biggest bantamweights I think you know, on the roster, and I think that you know my ability to lose that weight, uh, mm-hmm. in in having the you know the the techniques and stuff that 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 I've used that I've, I've you know obviously are working. Um, I think that's going to be, it's going to be detrimental in the long run. You know, you never want to, you never want to have a disadvantage going into a fight. And I think everyone will have a disadvantage. I'm going to be five, 10 pounds heavier than my opponent every single day on fight night. Wow. So you're, so you're saying you're about 15, 20 pounds for about what, like a two weeks, week and a half out. Is mm-hmm. that, is that pretty typical? Mm-hmm. Actually, it's, it's better than I have been. My wow. USC debut, uh, this wasn't a, this wasn't a, uh, I was like 172 pounds or something when I got the phone call a week out. Whoa. <laughs> so, and I made 46. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mm. do the math, 26 pounds. And that yeah. was that was really, really brutal. Um, 
but now I mean a, a couple hard workouts that week I'll get mm-hmm. within 10 pounds and then the last eight ten pounds I'll just uh, I'll do in the sauna 24 hours out and then I'll shoot back up to close to 160 fight night okay so what <laughs> what is gonna be your first meal after your, uh, your aljo fight <laughs> oh after the fight uh probably a big steak big steak huge, yeah I'm a huge uh, I'm a huge steak fan so Probably a big, big steak. Uh, yeah. Nothing crazy. I'm not really a sweets guy. I just like to eat a lot. Okay, well that's good. That, that gives you a step up on uh, Khabib. You, you stay away from that tiramisu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's let's, uh, let's talk about the UFC specifically. Your division, real quick. Uh, TJ uh, Dillashaw just recently fought Cody for the belt. Um, finished him again um, in quite spectacular fashion. Uh, I, in my opinion, TJ is one of the most skilled up guys. Uh, not just in your division. I think. Um, across all weight classes in the UFC, I think he's the real deal. He's really good, and I know you've said that you you admire at least in the way that he continually improves himself as a martial artist. You mirror that uh, in the way you train and the way you try to improve your game. Um, not necessarily who you think he's going to fight next, but who would you like to see TJ fight next? Um, uh, I guess uh, that's that question I have not been asked. I guess. Uh, Anybody but Cody Garbrandt or Dominic Cruz, because uh, that's kind of been the show for the last two years. I feel like, I mean, I'm personally on board with it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, Dominic Cruz, you know, he's got to stay healthy, and that's not his fault. You know, Dominic Cruz is a great, great champion. I'm not taking anything away from the guy. Uh, he's a great athlete to come back from what he's come back from. Right. Uh, but he shouldn't get a title shot off being off for two years. No way. There's so many guys that have been active, been fighting. You know, you got Moraes, you got a Sun Sao. The problem is the Sun Sao has already fought TJ twice. Right. So I think that kind of kills his shot. Mm-hmm. I mean, Marlon Moraes or uh, Henry Ciudo, those are the only two options I see. Honestly, I think a Sun Sao and Cruz should fight. And, um, you know, I think maybe Marlon Moraes fights John Lineker and, you know, they have like a little have a little fight off. Um, I feel like I'm still far enough away from that, that, uh, that conversation, you know, big win over Aljo, you know, could put me potentially in that conversation, but I feel like that's probably how it's going to shake down. I think, I think TJ is probably going to fight, uh, see Cejudo and those guys are, I mean, they're either going to sit on the bench and do nothing or they're going to have to start fighting each other. I mean, and it, they should, I mean, what's the, what's the holdup you got, you know, you're not getting a paycheck. You're not, you're not getting in the cage. Uh, you're not, you know, you're not stepping up or down. I think everyone's just so like, they're just clinging to that spot. Like it's, like everyone yeah. thinks they, they've earned that shot, but really, if you look at it, I mean, there's a lot of guys that have earned it. Right. Yeah. No. I. I. You gotta wonder, at least from a as a fight fan, um, how many more fights Dominic Cruz has left? Um, he's had an incredible career, but he's had so many not just like minor injuries, but significant like this could potentially Major. end your career type injuries. And he's right. and to his credit, like you said, he has come back, but and. You know, the other fighters may not be collecting a paycheck, but he is collecting the paycheck because he, he does yeah. the, uh, the, the work. As a, yeah, so I, you wonder if, like, maybe it's it's one of those things where, hey, you can kind of slip into this, um, you know, yeah, and not have yeah. to put your body through all of that. Because uh, you love the guy, but I just don't know. His body was obviously not made to really endure the grind for, for that long. It was kind of like response to, like, that type of training. His body was starting to, to break down. You wonder how long he wants to kind of stay in that lifestyle and – you know, if they're paying him pretty pretty well to be an, an analyst, uh, maybe he might just want to switch over and do that full time. You know, yeah, get, get I mean, up. I could def- I could definitely see that. I think Dominic Cruz's issue is that he doesn't have the patience to actually recover from injuries. Okay. Uh, I think I think really I think the issue is that he like, you know, instead of like taking, you know, six months to recover, I think he takes three and then just kind of goes light. At least that's kind of the feel I got from, you know, I knew a few guys that were in his camp and they were saying that he was training way too hard, way too soon after his, you know, first ACL surgery. And like oh, when he blew his knee out, like yeah. everybody was kind of like, oh, well, we saw this coming. You know, you weren't obviously weren't fully recovered. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's tough, man. I tell you one thing. I tell you from personal experience, you know, I've had knee injuries. I've had, you know, broken bones, all that stuff, uh, you know, from, from being a fighter. And that's tough. Injuries suck especially if you love what you do you know if you like if you like being an athlete like i do uh you know being on the sidelines is the absolute worst thing in the world yeah i can imagine um and for you know like a, a guy like cody garbrandt just um get iced twice uh by tj what what kind of uh 
like what advice would you have for a fighter like in that spot like what do you tell a guy like that from to be able to come back um from that because he he had a meteoric rise you know kind of went like unranked and then all of a sudden he was fighting for the belt um like what, what do you say like just or is it just kind of one of those things where he just kind of has to get back into it sort of forget the last one move ahead uh yeah i don't know i I would tell him to go to 125, honestly. Yeah. Um, I think he's the number one contender at 25. <laughs> uh, and I think he could probably beat Henry Cito. He's a great wrestler, uh, and he's fast. Interesting. And huh. uh, well, obviously, he wouldn't be the number one contender because DJ, but I think, I think right. he, he's not a big guy. He doesn't got a lot of weight. I mean, I've seen, I've seen the dude walking around at, like, 140, you know, low low 40s, and that's, like, that's pretty small for bantamweight. A lot of yeah. weights are, you know, a lot bigger. I, he mm-hmm. can make it. I mean, he talked about wanting that fight before, you know, TJ sat him down, you know. But I think that's the best option for him. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, where's the big fight? I mean, is he going to fight down that cruise again? I mean, who, who's he Who's he going to fight? I mean, that's going to be the, the kind of, you know, status fight that he wants, you know. Right. I don't know. That's actually uh, uh, very interesting. And, you know, your division thought, is absolutely stacked. But, you know, they, they have a hard time getting – you know, star power, like Demetrius, um, you know, before he lost to Cejudo was, you know, arguably people were saying pound for pound, one of the best yes. ever. Um, and they were having a hard time selling him. So, yeah. uh, yeah, that division could, that's a, that's an interesting way to, to kind of solve all of that. Yeah. So, put, him, put him at 25. I mean, problem solved. You got two, you know, superstars fighting. Right. So, um, and I know obviously you want to be in that conversation. You want to be one of the right. talked about as one of the top guys in your division. You're going to have the opportunity to do so. Uh, you get to fight Sterling, UFC 228. Um, the headline of this card is uh, the Woodley versus Till fight, the welterweight title fight. Now, Woodley has been on record saying that he will not take on a backup fight if Till doesn't make weight. What are, what are your thoughts on this hardline stance? Uh, well, I feel like if he doesn't take a backup fight, I mean, there's a chance that whole car gets canceled. Yeah. I'm mean, honestly, I've only seen it one other time, but, uh, uh, I think it could happen, you know, hmm. in Jack, I remember when it was years ago, I remember the only reason I remember is because, uh, my, uh, my training partner and good friend, Darren Kokshnik was fighting on the card and he got sidelined because John Jones wouldn't take a replacement um for a title fight so they scratched the whole card yeah. uh, i could honestly see that happening if if you know daring till doesn't make weight this whole card might get scratched you know what i mean wow. and uh so you guys are that, all kind of like come on till <laughs> yeah, get, your, get your shit together right? uh yeah i mean one way or another i know that i'm gonna be in the cage eventually with Aljamain sterling i honestly think that everything will work out fine in you know September eighth, everything will go without a hitch. Uh, at least that's what you know, I'm praying for, because uh, I really want to get in there. I really want to show people what I've been working on. So uh, let's let's get into your fight um, with Aljo. You guys have had some intense back and forth. And you can you could clarify this a bit for for the fans. Like, when did this even start? When the trash talking started? Uh, it was you know it was just a it was just a uh, one comment I made about you know. He, he said something about being the best grappler in the division. I don't even really get on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, but somebody met, said something to me about it. And uh, I hopped on there and I looked at it. And I was like, what, what the hell? And, I, <laughs> and I, I'm not normally a guy that talks shit on Twitter. But mm-hmm. it seems to be the best way to get uh, what you want. And uh, I started thinking about it. And before I sent the message, I was like, okay, who's going to be the next guy I'm going to fight? I'm like, well, I, I could sit around and wait. Or, you know, maybe let's make, let's make some shit happen. So I kind of... I goaded him into, uh, you know, getting into a little back and forth thing, and you know, he was he was kind of big brother to me, but I was like, hey, you know, I did beat a guy that beat you, so, you know, screw you, and and then it and then it got personal, and now it's just, and now it's getting weird. It's getting really weird. He's sending me like videos on Instagram, of him, <laughs> like I wish, I mean, I wish I could post them. I can't figure out how to get him off the my Instagram uh, feed messages, but he's sending me some weird videos and <laughs> people are saying some really weird stuff. His fans are saying some weird stuff to me. Yeah. Like weird. <laughs> I mean, like I, I just, like it's not even like insulting. It's just weird. I'm like, uh, what? 
yeah, you can just like show it like if you're on like a laptop or something, just like hold up your phone. It's like look at this, look at this crazy stuff he's sending me. <laughs> oh man, it's just it's it's gotten it's gotten weird. The guy is not he's not the he's not yeah. the sharpest fan of the box. Uh, <laughs> it's it's one thing to like kind of get in a battle uh, with somebody. I, my brother and I are are known for you know kind of being shit talkers, and mm-hmm. you know we banter back and forth a lot. So it's something I'm. I'm actually really, really good at and actually enjoy doing, um, but doing it with someone that just does weird stuff, it just kind of, I don't know, it's, it, it makes it awkward. I mean, <laughs> it's, he's, a, he's a weird dude. So it's I interesting. To beat him up. So this was actually a little bit of gamesmanship on your part to try to try to get this fight with him. You were you were yeah. just kind of like throwing out like a like a hook, <laughs> see see yep. if you could see if you can get something. So that's, yeah. Uh, and it worked. I mean, I, I knew it was going to work. I, I, I had the feeling. Um, I don't know. I just had the feeling he was calling out Dominic Cruz. I was like, "There's no way that fight's happening." Right. And just in my head, I knew it. I knew it wouldn't take much. And uh, it's funny because a lot of people uh, came back and said, "You know, Aljamain Sterling uh, called called me out," um, which is fine. I don't, I don't care. I don't care if I get the credit for it or not. You know what? What? What matters is that you know I get the opportunity to fight him. You know, I get the opportunity to fight him, the top ten guy. A guy that I know a lot of people feel like you know could could uh, has that has that big fight potential. So you know, for me, it's just uh, it's just about showing up September eighth. You know, all the hard work's done. I just gotta make weight. Let's go beat this dude up. Yeah, I think the uh, the toughest place to really make fights is for like the guys in your position, like the uh, the five through ten guys. You know, obviously the top five guys; those guys are in high demand. They're the contenders. Um, but you guys, it's like it's kind of tough because. You want a fight that will move you forward, so mm-hmm. you don't necessarily want to fight like a like an up and coming guy or whatever. Like you, you were like, I want to, I want to push myself into the top five. So like, right. if you're like in his spot, it's kind of like what, it it's it's tough to kind of make those fights happen. So I think this is a great fight for both of you guys. I think yeah. it's a it's a good fight between two uh, top ten guys, and you know I think who, the the winner of this fight, I think you're right. I think they're gonna probably move up. I don't really know. How it works. Some of those guys up there, they're not quite as as active as, as other fighters. I think you should yeah. reward people that are active. Um, I'm, try- the- I'm trying. I'm trying to be as active as I can. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I want to keep collecting those paychecks. Right. I'm ready to fight. If I'm healthy, I want to fight. So you seem like really confident. I've heard you kind of talk about uh, Sterling's game. Obviously, you're very confident in your own skills. Let's, let's have you put on your coach's cap real quick. What are some of the things that really uh, stand out to you about Aljo's game? What are things that he excels at? What are what are some things that you've kind of been uh, working on in, in, in camp, uh, just specifically because of Sterling's skill set? Yeah, I mean, he does a really good job making people fight his fight, right? He uh, He's a little bit longer for the weight class, I think. I mean, actually, when I actually see him and get in there with him, I don't feel like he's going to be as big as what um, he kind of looks in, in a lot of his fights, but uh yeah he just he does a good job of making people fight his fight you know he he throws a lot of empty kicks on the outside not a lot a lot of guys do that not a lot of guys do it uh as successful as he does mm-hmm. um and i think it's just because he's a pretty athletic pretty athletic guy so he gets in and out i mean he just he gets guys to chase him around and he kicks and runs kicks and runs kicks and runs plants his feet every now and then he's nearly not the he's really not like an in the pocket type guy okay. and then he shoots um, and he's, he's good on top, you know, he's good on top. He's, he's been successful when he takes guys back, you know? So, I mean, for me, I, I've watched every single one of his fights. I've seen, you know, the same habits, styles, reactions, and every single one of his fights. So I really don't believe that, that he's doing anything to really change, um, his game so much. Cause so I feel like I have a really, really good idea as to who he's going to be and how he's going to react to the situation that I'm going to put him in, in the fight. And I think that's something that, I really pride myself on as an athlete is I, I do study my opponents. Uh, you know, I make my training partners study my opponents and I, and I make them give me those looks. Um, that way, you know, when I get in the cage, it's almost like I'm seeing it all over again. You know, when I, in that Brian Carey fight, you know, after, uh, you know, I dropped that first round, uh, I just, I literally like, it was like I was in the gym, you know, I, uh, I, I lost that round and in my head, I was like, Man, what like what like you literally you know what you know what you do you saw you gotta just go do what you've been training to do for the last two months, and then you know as soon as I got out of my head you know as soon as the nerves I kind of shook the nerves off like you know I, after that I, it was all, you know uh, it was all my game plan and what I was what I've been training to do for a while so, um, 
I just got to come out and do that right off the whistle against Sterling, and I'll clean them up. All right. Uh, I got a question. Did, is there a standardized way you guys measure reach? Because I, I have a hard time, like, I have a hard time thinking like he's that much, uh, has that much of a reach advantage. It just doesn't seem like you guys are like body type and <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's physically possible. I don't know. Do you, do I, you... I think he does. I think, he, I think a lot of, a lot of reach is like how big your hands are right. like, and, uh, like how wide your shoulders are. Okay. So like, like I don't have, uh, I don't have wide shoulders and I don't have big hands. So I think that takes a lot of my reach. My, I have a 65 inch reach, but like if I close my fist and like reach out at somebody like it's pretty much like darren has like 72 inch reach or something right and he's like one of my main training partners and if we like stand like punch to punch like he's maybe an inch like his arms are maybe an inch longer than mine so i think a lot of reach is kind of like what you have in your shoulders more than like like, maybe how so it's a little misleading it should be like it should be your arm your arm you know what i mean how long your how long your arms are because that that's a little more important and i have like a pretty stocky frame so it doesn't really give me like it doesn't make me look any longer. I'm never going to be a model, but I'm okay with it. Right. Yeah. This is like a, some people have – like Brock Lesnar is like the massive reach, but it was mostly back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I see. He's all shoulders. Super yeah. crazy broad. Right. So uh, I know uh, some fans have gotten on you a little bit uh, about the, some of your decision victories lately. Um but, you know, the decisionator. I, the decisionator. Uh, but, you know, I, I actually see, um, like, the, the decision-making of, of a smart fighter. I think you're good at picking your shots and you're good at minimizing the damage you take and the, the opportunities that you give your opponents. Uh, and, and, you and you know, you set up your takedowns well. Like, what is your mindset going into September 8th? Is it when it all costs, you just needed to get the W so that you can take that next step? Or I know you've said – you know, every fighter says he wants to finish it. He wants to finish it. Like, how do you pr- prioritize those things? Do you, like, how much risk are you willing to take as a fighter to, to go out there, show out for the fans, and, and get the finish? And how much is it like, no, like the most important thing is the W tonight? Well, always the win is always the most important, right? I mean, right. Uh, I'd rather win a boring fight than lose an exciting one. I don't ever want to be one of those guys that, like, puts his brain in the line just to, you know, just for a $50,000 bonus. Uh, the win is always the most important thing. But... Mm-hmm. You know, in my head, I know that I'm capable of knocking guys out and doing it intelligently and setting up my shots. Um, I really just think I've run out of time. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just, I've started late in fights. I haven't really like got to like my setups and the things I know to do um, until the second and third rounds in my last few fights. And against Garway, honestly, I ran out of gas. I didn't have it. I, like the, I started hitting him with hard shots. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of mid third round, and I could feel it. I could feel. I could feel like he was breaking, and then like my gas tank to city, and I just didn't have it in me. Uh, against Duke and Wah, I started late. I, I same thing. You know, I started late, and that's that's something I got to adjust in my training. I you know I've been I've been working on you know coming out guns blazing, um, and I just uh, it's, it's it's all metal. You know, it's all metal for me. It's all metal. Like I have the tools. I know I can. I know I can put guys out. I've knocked out. 30 40 different people you know i know i have the tools to knock people out i've done it so many times in the past so it's just about making it happen in, in the octagon you know uh i have i have these i have these law moments you know what i mean where I, i'm winning these decisions and not getting these finishes but uh you know my two fights before before uh before the ufc were both uh you know tko so uh i'll get back to it i'll get back to it i think certainly is the first guy that i'm gonna finish in the cage well, i know we're on uh, fans are uh love to see that i so are you a little bit uh i don't know fearful is the right word but if you kind of adjust the approach that you take inside the cage I, th- there's very few people on the planet that can really understand quite the experience that it's like to be fighting in a cage um how much do you actually recover in between rounds i'm wondering if you go out you change up your style a little bit you go out as you say guns blazing the first round is there fear that you might you might taper off in the later rounds uh no no, definitely no fear of that. Uh, when I fought Caraway, I got really banged up in that training camp. I was pretty limited. There's a lot of things I couldn't get the. I really couldn't wrestle for most of that training camp because I had some, I had some uh, a little bit of a rib injury. So mm-hmm. I could, there's I just couldn't get those. You know, there's no way to like mimic those live wrestling rounds. So right. uh, that was that was a that was a tough. I was in a tough situation for that camp. But this camp, I've done the worst, the worst of the worst. 
uh, you know, fight gone wrong workouts back to back to back to back to back. And, uh, you know, if you, if you do, when you do those workouts where, you know, you're constantly being put in bad positions and you have to fight out of them, you know, it either breaks you or makes you. And, you know, this training camp, early in this training camp, I was putting myself in the worst possible positions for weeks. And, uh, you know, I, it was it was awful, but, I, I, you know, I made it through it. And now, like, my conditioning, I know that no matter where the fight goes, and if I'm in trouble, if I get knocked down, no matter what happens, I'm going to be able to get up, recover, and I'll have the gas tank for it. I mean, my resting heart rate is, like, 36 right now. I literally had to do like uh all kinds of crazy uh tests because the the uh the, the doctors that um at the usc were concerned that i might have some kind of heart issue um it was either i was just in really good shape or i have a, i have a, you know a heart issue but mm-hmm. they you know after you know a couple thousand bucks <laughs> and three or four different you know cardiologist appointments they're like yeah he's just in good shape he's fine so uh I'm that's, in good shape. Well, that's I'm good to hear. Go. That's a very wide spectrum. It's like either you're in really good shape or, <laughs> or you're going to die. Yeah. yeah, it was good. It was a super, yeah, it was a super, uh, I had to do a stress test. I'm like, this is a freaking stress test. You guys are testing me. Like, I'm uh, saying that I have a heart issue. Like, there's no way. All right. Uh, it's time to uh, face to facts real quick. I'm going to ask you a series of extremely difficult questions, and we do keep score. So, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. All right, good. One for one. Okay, if you can ask the president one question, what would it be? <laughs> uh, do you like your job? All right, that's a good one. Um, if, uh, let's see here, we lost the video. Oh, there you are. Okay. If uh, Apple designed a car, would it still have windows? Yes. All right. Uh, and what sports do you like to watch besides MMA? Boxing and wrestling. Okay. Oh, you, you stick with the combat sports. Okay. Um, yeah. Who wins in a fight? Predator or Kevin from Home Alone? Kevin from Home Alone. No, oh, yeah, I like it. I like it. And he's just, you know, you give him time. He's crafty. still going to send up. He's still crafty. <laughs> Very crafty. Would you rather be uh, the greatest athlete that ever lived or the smartest person that ever lived? Ooh, the smartest person. All right. And, uh, you know, not to get too controversial on our show, we want to, you know, keep things family friendly. But if a white man can sing the blues, does that mean that a blue man can sing the whites? I think so. All right. Uh, you know how, like, there are some movies that, like, they, they, they give you, like, a little disclaimer, like, no animals were harmed in the making of this film? Does that mean yeah. that, like, every other movie that doesn't have that disclaimer actually harmed animals? I almost guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if, like, could they just put, like, a little thing at the bottom, like, just like, hey, uh, Dave actually dropped a camera on a squirrel. Super sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, only a few <laughs> animals died in the making of this movie. I don't know why he keeps showing on my camera. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, in your opinion, would Chris Rock be half as famous as he is today if he went by his actual name, Christian Rock? No. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Do you consider yourself to be lucky? Yes, very. What was your favorite toy growing up? Legos. Legos, yeah. That's, that's a win. Uh, if a mime gets arrested, uh, does, do the police have to tell him that he has the right to actually speak? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, if you could be a, a cartoon character temporarily, who would you pick? Ooh, Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. Do you consider yourself a hunter or a gatherer? Hunter. Do you believe in aliens? Yes. Who's your favorite fighter of all time? Ooh, uh, man, that's a tough one. Boxing, any, uh, all that. Uh, yeah, sure. Boxing, MMA. How about uh, Achilles? Oh, Greek. Uh, I'm, just, no. I'm I'm hitting a blank. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> okay, sure. What is your favorite Disney movie? Disney movie, um, The Lion King. Oh, okay, yeah, that's an excellent one. Why do you think tennis balls are fuzzy? Slow them down. Oh yeah, that's a. It's actually 
Why? <laughs> um, how do you think a man can go 10 days without sleeping? I don't think that's possible. It's actually a trick question. He sleeps at night. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if, you could, yeah. if you can use a magic, magic eight ball and get the absolute truth to one question, what would you ask? Um, can I travel? Can I travel through time? Okay. And if you could travel through time, what time period would you go to? Um, early 1900s. Okay. All right. So, uh, I actually lied. We don't, we don't actually keep questions. We don't actually keep score, but uh, we do have, we do have one last question for you. <laughs> um, not to call anybody out. Um, you know, I know uh, you're not that kind of person. I know you, you kind of said you, you baited Sterling into it, but um, let's say you're victorious September 8th and you, you, they hand you to Mike. Who would you, who would you like to, uh, you know, like not to call him out, but like, who do, you, who do you go in your head? You know what? That guy, that would be, that'd be really interesting. That'd be a hell of a fight. I'd like to fight that guy. I've been, I've been, I've been manifesting this for uh, a, a month now. So I'm literally going to get the microphone and I'm going to say I'll bag the whole division, but I want to fight in Milwaukee. I don't care who it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, if you, uh, why don't you give our listeners your, your social media info? Where can they find you? I think it's Cody Stamen. So I try to make it uh, simple for everybody. Uh, C-O-D-Y-S-T-A-M-A-N-N. Uh, yeah. Check me out. All right, I'm, we'll a weird, I'm a weird guy, but it's <laughs> pretty cool stuff too. We'll, uh, we'll put that down in the uh, description below. It's very, uh, courteous of you to, to keep it simple for all of your fans and cody i do appreciate you you taking the time uh, to do this with me i you know i think that you're you're a very smart fighter i, I think you're a humble fighter i really appreciate that about you and i'm sure that you will be fighting for that belt at some point in your career and i want you to wish i want to wish you the best of luck um not only in your fight against Aljamain sterling but for the rest of your career i appreciate it man thank you thanks for the interview all right